Practically speaking, that was the the uh, the first truth that well, not the first one of the the first uh, truths that the church had to rally around and and solidify because there was uh, there there was some some talk that he wasn't God, um, and so they they had to, to formalize that. The Council of Nicaea in 325 A.D. is where they landed on that one. Um, so we are standing on their shoulders, right? Um, so. Why is it important that Jesus was God? Holy God. Sinless. Say what? To be sinless. Okay, to be sinless. So would you throw that with, with God or with with humanity? His, his humanity. In, in that, I would say definitely address his Godship first because that is absolutely foundational. Because nobody can be saved apart from, you know, if no sinner on earth that can save. Oh, so the fact that he is God then makes him sinless and gives him the ability. Okay, okay, gotcha. Okay, all right. It's actually both because being fully man, he was able to be tempted. If okay. he was God, he couldn't have been tempted. But then the only way he could resist the temptation was being fully God. Okay, all right. I'm shaking my head up here. I've got lots of dialogue going on in my head right now. I want to hear from everybody. Yeah. What else? Are we talking about fully God? We'll, we'll throw it out. Fully God, fully man. It doesn't matter. We just we'll lump it all together. The importance. He had to he had to be man so that we like he could uh, he had to be man so that he could go before us and be part of that savior process because man was cursed because of sin and so he had to be part of man to save us i guess but also to go through that process he had to be god to make salvation happen to conquer all that okay okay what else he also needed to have a human lineage to fulfill the prophecies in the Old Testament. Okay. All right. Okay. I heard some people. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. That's why I, I love these think tanks because we're we're all hitting different different aspects of this. What else? I, I think being fully man, when when God, the Bible says that uh, we're made in God's image, okay. I think just the fact that He came in the form of a human solidifies that yes indeed all the active a lot of the attributes that we have as far as our feelings and just the, the, the way we communicate with with god he had to come as a man to prove that yes indeed we know what what genesis says is, is true okay so the the fact that that um you're, you're talking more than just the experience of mankind then or are you talking about the experience just of mankind? The, uh, um, the, the attributes of mankind that okay. we get from being made in God's image okay. were personified through Jesus. Okay. All okay. right. So did he have to be fully man to die for our sins? Okay. So you asked that question. Did he have to be fully man? Also, the part God derived from that death. Okay. But he had to be man to die. Right? Okay. All right. Otherwise, there's no sacrifice. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So now we're talking about, and, and you'll you'll see a lot of this stuff bleed right into the next question, with where we talk about the the substitutionary aspect of what Jesus did. Um, but yeah, so he, he had to be eternal in order to endure the eternal wrath of God, this, which is what we deserve for our sin. Okay? I think you have to say something. That's not my original question in front of me right now. Your original what? Do you have crucial for salvation? Is it crucial from, for the counselor of me to understand my salvation, or crucial, crucial to be saved, or both? Which way am I trying to yeah, so in, in, in this one, it's saying why, so it's crucial for salvation. Okay. The, the truth of salvation. So I can leave out anything related to me understanding my salvation and just specifically relate to answer to, in order to be saved, Jesus had to be 
the purpose of his ministry. Correct. In, in, in order to provide salvation, yeah, the, Jesus needed to be fully God and he needed to be fully man. The, the other side of that too is, is it, um, Scripture clearly states he was fully God and he was fully man. So yes, it's crucial for salvation, but it's also because this is that, that's what, what Scripture said. All right, well, here's, um, here's how I want to kind of attack this, okay? Um, five evidences of Jesus' deity. So we're, we're going to prove his deity, and then we're going to talk about his humanity, and then we're going to talk about why both of those are crucial for salvation. So as I'm talking through this, think about all the answers that were given and how that can fit in. All right, so uh, five evidences. Jesus claimed to be divine through his claims of existence before Adam. Right, so we got John eight fifty eight. Anybody know what that says? Before Abraham was, I am. Before Abraham was, I am. Who was he talking to? The Pharisees. the Pharisees. And so we know from that interaction that Jesus absolutely claimed to be God. Why do we know he didn't just have bad grammar? <laughs> Oh, because it's all caps in her bio. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's hard for me to So when God said, I am. Okay, so he's, he's referencing when, when God was talking to Moses. And Moses said, who shall I say sent me? And God said, tell them I am. But how do we know that that's what he was doing? Because it doesn't say that right there. But how do we know that's exactly what he was communicating? Okay, because the reaction of the Pharisees was they were going to stone him, right? And, and it, like there was no law to stone for bad grammar, but there was for claiming to be God. It was a sacred, like, yeah. ever since that happened, you weren't supposed to yeah. say that. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, so Jesus claimed to be divine through his claims of existence before Abraham. There's also the pre-existence of Christ, right? Um, John 1, 1 through 14, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Good. Don't. There, there, is, there are people who will come knocking on your door, at your door. They have the, the New World translation, and it will say, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. Right? So if Jehovah's Witness comes to knock on your door... Ask for their translation and show them the difference. Like putting an article there, a God, now that's different than he was God. Exactly the same. Okay, So we have the pre-existence of Christ. Micah 5.2 is another verse there. Um, another uh, evidence of, of Christ's deity is that Christ claims to have many of the same attributes of God. Right? In Mark chapter 2, he forgives someone's sin. Who can forgive someone from, from their sin but God alone? Jesus is claiming to be God. Now, that's just one example. You can go through uh, the, the, the Gospels and see Christ's claims and, and of, of having the same attributes of God. The fourth, then, evidence is um, that many of, God, uh, many of the divine names that are attributed to God are also attributed to Jesus. Right? He is Emmanuel, Mighty God, Son of God, Christ, Messiah, Lord, Son of God. Um, so some of the divine names of the Old Testament are attributed to him. Once again, those are Emmanuel, Mighty God, Son of God, Christ, Messiah, Lord, Son of God. And then in John, this is the fifth one, in John 10, verse 30, Jesus clearly states that he's equal with the Father, right? I and the Father are one. Um, and then they, the people who were listening, promptly called him a blasphemer, so they understood exactly what he was saying. All right, so there's five evidences of his divine nature. And so as you're talking through this, describe the dual natures of Jesus. There you go, you've got five, five evidences of that, right? Um, so that's the first nature. Second nature, the second of his two natures are his human nature. And there's several evidences of that as well. Right? Um, how was he born? Yeah, a virgin birth. Right? He didn't just poof appear. 
he was born. And I think that's huge, that, that he was born. He came as a man. I remember the first time I was, I was ever asked this question, why didn't Jesus just show up at about like age 30, like come down uh -huh. at, at age 30, live for, you know, three years, and then be crucified and die? Why was it necessary that he had to be born? and live for 30 years. I've never wrestled with that before, and that was fun to wrestle with, so I'll let you wrestle with that. Um, another evidence, he developed in normal, physical, and intellectual terms. Right? He, he, he grew up just like every other human grows up. Uh, he, didn't, he was not born um, needing, well, he, he, he needed to, to learn, just like everybody else needs to learn. And there, there are times in here where if you think to you, like, how is he fully God? omniscient and needed to learn like okay so there's this hypostatic union that we're not going to fully comprehend so um luke 252 he developed in normal physical and intellectual terms also jesus lived under certain normal human conditions this is another evidence of his humanness right he was hungry he was thirsty right he was weary those are all, you can find those in, in, in Scripture, right? Matter of fact, that's where he was tested by Satan in, in those. I mean, then he was called a man by Paul and Peter in Acts 2, 22, and in 1 Corinthians 15, 21. Jesus was called a man. All right, so now here's why is this crucial for salvation. Um, if Jesus was not divine and therefore sinless... Right? He could not have satisfied the wrath of God. He absolutely couldn't have. Right? So he had to be sinless. If he was a man and nothing more, then he would not have been qualified to satisfy the wrath of God. The death of God's Son was the only one who was qualified to satisfy God's wrath. If Jesus was not human, then in what sense could he have really died? Right? And this... Uh, starts to touch on the issue of the atonement. Someone had to die. And then Jesus being human proves that there was real death. All right? So, crucial for salvation. Somebody had to die, and somebody had to satisfy the wrath of God. And only the eternal Son of God could do that. Right? Now, this isn't in the question, but I always like to, to bring this in. What does this have to do with biblical counseling? Okay. All right, so the, the fact that he's human means that he can sympathize with us, right? Uh, and I'm starting to quote Hebrews chapter 4 here, um, where he was tempted just as we are tempted. Like we, we don't have somebody who is way far off who's just guessing. We have a great high priest who is tempted just as we are tempted, right, yet without sin. All right, so Jesus can identify with us. What, what, what does that matter, by the way, if he can identify with us or not? So that he cares. Okay, yeah. I mean, it, it, it does show that, that, that he cares. Uh, but if, this is a cool thought from my perspective. You might not think it's that cool. Um, but... If he's up in heaven and he cares and he can sympathize and that's it, who said that? He's our advocate. So it's not like he's up in heaven twiddling his thumbs going, man, I know exactly how that feels. Bummer. Right? He's not doing that. He is going to God on our behalf as our advocate. That's 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. My dear children, if you are, I'm, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if any of you do sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is going to God on our behalf, not just in a, hey God, you know, and, and I don't mean to be flippant about this. Um, but not, he, he's, he's not going to God just saying, hey, remember what I did on the cross. I mean, he is pleading our case as somebody who has walked in our shoes as humans on this earth. And that's that's a big deal in the counseling world. Because that means you, the counselor, don't have to have experienced the person the what the other person across the, the way, maybe it's a table or maybe it's just a chair, has experienced. But you can lead them to the one who promises he has. And there's a lot of confidence there. 
right? Why else is, is this important for a biblical counselor? Without either one of them, you don't have the cross. Okay. And that's where grace and redemption and everything is. Yeah, at least an effective cross, right? right. Um, yeah. A cross Otherwise that did you something. Just would have yeah, and we are what Paul said. We were fools, if that's the case. Okay. If, if, um, when Jesus says, "I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit as as the Helper." And if we truly believe that that change is going to happen from the inside out, and the Holy Spirit's going to help us, um, Jesus could not have sent say, "I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit," but he had he could do that being both fully God and yeah, man. yeah, absolutely, yeah, great, great point. There's other. There's one other big one that I just kind of want to land on. Well, <clears throat> our sins are forgiven. And you know, guilt of sin, the thing that caused people to do things as counselees, is because they're, they're feeling guilty to, to know that it, if Jesus died for their sins, that they can be forgiven too. Yeah. And they can live a new life. Yeah. And, and I think that's the gospel rests here. And in question 13, and 14, and 15, and 16, like we're. It, as biblical counselors, I, I, I would want you all to, to hear this from me. Make sure counselees understand, believe, and have put their trust in the gospel. Right? Don't, don't assume it. Um, really try and flush it out because I think in the world that we live in, people have become inoculated to the gospel. And here's what I mean by that. They've heard the language over and over. They've heard the right things to say. They've heard the wrong things to say. They've had people correct them here, people correct them here. And before long, you ask them, what's the gospel? And they just, blah, here it is. And we don't know what that means for them, right? So um, the, the gospel issue, and of course it's written here with crucial for salvation. There's the, the gospel with this question and all the rest. It's, it's important for biblical counselors because there are times, more times than maybe you'll be aware of, where you are presenting the gospel in an effective, salvific way for the first time. All right, so don't, like God could have orchestrated their life in such a way that they are coming to see you to hear the gospel. And, uh, and that's, that's a weighty thing. All right. Got, got everything you need for question 12? <laughs> All right, well, let's move on into question 13, because it just gets better. Substitutionary atonement. All right, substitutionary atonement. Um, so let's just kind of tackle this one together as a big group. All right, so um, let's, let's think through here. Oh, are we having well, camera issues? All right. <laughs> we'll, we'll hang out just a minute and see if the blue light comes on. Sometimes this thing can be, oh, there it is. We got a, we got a blue light now. Oh, it went red. Oh, there, now it's red. We're, we're good. <laughs> are, are we still good? Okay. Um, so, uh, provide an explanation. Provide an explanation of and the biblical basis for the doctrine of substitutionary atonement. So there's that there's that phrase that we need to cover, explaining the implications of this doctrine for human guilt of sin. Now relate your understanding of this to the concept of false guilt. And you're going to want to make sure to have that idea of false guilt in here because that is a major Freudian concept, false guilt. Um, as a matter of fact, a, a, a true psychoanalytic psychologist, that is going to be one of their main goals is to, to get you to get guilt out of your life. And it's not going to be through the cross. It's going to be through convincing you you've just been thinking wrong and there's no reason to be guilty. Um, Right, and so, uh, yeah, I, I might tie in some of my thesis work to this question here in just a minute because it's, it's big in, a, in that, that area. All right, so let, let's talk about this first. Substitutionary atonement. Let's break this apart. Substitutionary means what? <clears throat> in place of. I like that. In place of, right? So somebody is being a substitute here. Um, and then what's atonement? Payment. Okay? Payment. Okay. All right. So, and I've given you a bunch of 
quotes, I think, for this one. Should have a bunch of them. Yes. So, uh, what you have down here, this is on page 50. The view of Christ's death presented here has frequently been called the theory of penal substitution. Christ's death was penal in that he bore a penalty when he died. His death was also a substitution in that he was a substitute for us when he died. And this has been the orthodox understanding of the atonement held by evangelical theologians in contrast to other views that attempt to explain the atonement apart from the idea of the wrath of God or payment of the penalty for sin. All right? Um, and so I, I thought it, it would be, I mean, if, if I read that, I might want to know what are some of those other theories that are out there or I, ideas that are out there. Um, well, there's the, the uh, governmental theory of why Jesus died, right? Jesus, he was a demonstration of justice, okay? There's the ransom theory where Jesus was the victor over sin and evil. He was just the victor, though. He, did, he wasn't the substitute for anybody. He was just the victor over that. Um, and there's a, there's a few more other ones that get a little bit further out there. But all of the other theories don't have Jesus as a substitute, as actually accomplishing something on the cross. right? And that's big from my perspective. If he didn't actually do something on the cross, think through the logic with me. If he didn't do something on the cross, isn't there the potential he didn't do anything? Well, if if Jesus only provided a potential, right? Isn't there the potential that nobody does anything with his potential? <laughs> well, just, yeah. Well, and, and, and Jesus kind of did all that, and maybe it was for naught. Right? So the, the fact that he actually accomplished something on the cross is, is huge. So the, the penal substitutionary atonement, Jesus bore the wrath of God on the cross, and he did so in our place. I think that's short, that's concise, that says it right there. All right? um, several important concepts that help us get there, um, that, that, that allow us to, to understand this the way that we need to understand this. Um, here's... Five or four, sorry. Four different aspects to the, the penal substitutionary atonement. Now, you don't have to put that the, the, the penal in there because um, it just says substitutionary atonement, but often that will be, those are the, the links. If you go, if you Google it, if you go into your systematic theologies, you'll see a lot of those that, that terminology there, okay? So, number one, sacrifice. Christ's sacrificial death is the, the payment of death that we deserve. Plain and simple. Right, there's the sacrifice. And I, I want to look at some of these scriptures just so that you're not taking my word for it. Uh, Hebrews chapter 10. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 10, verses 12 through 14. Actually, I'm going to back up to verse 11. Every priest stands daily ministering and offering, time after time, the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But he, this is talking about Jesus, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from the right time onward until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. For by one offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. Hang on to that verse because you're going to be able to use that in a few more questions coming up, okay? Mm -hmm. um, but there he is. He is the final sacrifice. You don't have to sacrifice over and over, final sacrifice. Um, Hebrews chapter 9, verses 11 and 12. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, and not through the blood of goats and calves, 
but through his own blood, he entered the holy place once and for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Having obtained it. There it is, solidified. All right? One more, Hebrews 10, verse 4. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. There you go. All right? Impossible. The first one, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 12 through 14. All right, so one important concept in substitutionary atonement is that there was a sacrifice that was made, absolutely made. And the fact that, that Jesus was human, I'm going to tie this back into the other one, means it was a real sacrifice. It wasn't pretend, it wasn't uh, an image of, right? Um, it was a real sacrifice. Second important concept is the word propitiation. I don't know about you, I rarely use that word, maybe in this class, uh, and that's it. But here's what that means. Christ died in order to satisfy the wrath of God that was on us for our sin. Right? So 1 John chapter 2, verse 2. I've already quoted 1 John 2, 1 already, so we'll just hop in here at verse 2. And he himself, here's that word, is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. All right? So 1 John 2, 2, you got Romans 3, 24 and 25. Anybody know what that one says? And okay. So I'm going to belt it out real loud. It, it, it's okay to do an open book test or open book quote. <laughs> and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over the over former sins. There you go. Alright. So Jesus took our punishment. Plain and simple. He took the wrath you deserved. Alright, so we've talked about sacrifice, we've talked about propitiation. Now the other and a third concept is substitutionary. Right? He took my place. He took your place. All right, 2 Corinthians 5.21. Now, this is one that will mess with you a little bit if you think too long about it. Because um, how can he be sinless and then have be sin at the same time? You know, we're just going to have to take the Scripture's word for it here. Um, 2 Corinthians 5.21. He, being God, made him, Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. Another verse you can use in a few questions when we talk about union with Christ. You can use that verse there as well. Right? 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24 is another verse. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you were healed. Right? So he bore our sins in his body on the cross. There's the substitution. All right? Christ died in our place. So sacrifice, propitiation, substitution, and then a fourth important concept here is reconciliation right Jesus actually made a way the way for us to be reconciled or to be made right with God we were an enemy and now we're a friend we were at war and now we have peace so 2 Corinthians 519 is uh, since I'm not there anymore but we'll we'll read it here Anybody know what that's talking about anyways if you can't quote it? No. Reconciliation? 
Yeah, <laughs> talk about reconciliation, absolutely. And, and, and that's actually part of our job is to be a, a, an ambassador, right? Where we, we share with others what has been given to us. So I'm going to start in verse 18. Now, all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Right. All right, so there's four concepts built into that substitutionary atonement that, that can help you answer that question. All right? But that's not it. What's, what's, the, what's all that driving at? What, what does this question want you to wrestle with? Um, or not, not wrestle with, but attach to this idea of substitutionary atonement. How it applies in the counseling office? Uh, but specifically, what, what topic in the counseling office? Guilt. Yeah, guilt. Um, because you'll find that is a huge topic. Um, yeah? I just made a comment. A, a good visual I, I like is um, when Christ was on the cross and it says that when he died, it says that the curtain was torn in two. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, now we have a visual where we're going back to the temple where we've got God's presence in the Holy of Holies and now that curtain being torn, you know what, now I know that I have fellowship and I have relationship with the Father. Yeah. And it's just a, it's a good image of, yes, when I do feel guilt and sin, Christ gave me that ultimate pathway of fellowship there that, that can't be taken away. Yeah. And, and that, that can only happen if you're sinless. <laughs> right? Uh, I get, that, that couldn't just be Ben being Ben without Christ. And going into the presence of God. Yeah. Good. I like that visual. I'm all about visuals. Yeah. Um, so guilt, right? And, and so let's, let's define guilt this way. A judicial condition caused by sin. All right? So it's a, it's, it is a condition caused by sin. A person isn't guilty because they feel guilty. Huge distinction. They have violated God's standard... And that's why they are guilty of sin. All right? And so, I don't have to feel guilty to be guilty. Does, does that make sense? If I say that? Uh, I, I found that out to be true when I got pulled over by a policeman one day. Yeah. Right? Um, I did not feel an ounce of guilt. Not one ounce. Even when I saw the lights behind me. I thought to myself, oh, I wonder what's going on. Still not guilty. Walks up to my car window. Do you know why I pulled you over? No guilt. I have no idea. Why'd you pull me over? Because you were going 10 miles an hour over. Still didn't feel guilty. I thought he was wrong. <laughs> right? And lo and behold, there was a short chunk of road. This is over in Port Orchard. If you're ever over there, there's a chunk of road where the county doesn't own it and the city won't claim it. So nobody puts a sign there. It's only 25. So it goes from 35 to... For, for about 300 feet, it's 25, and then it goes back up to 35, and guess where the sheriffs sit? Yeah. Man, mm -hmm. still don't think I'm guilty. <laughs> but the judge yeah. said, you're guilty. And I did 30-some hours of community service because I'm too cheap to pay a ticket. Uh, and all that said, I was guilty. Okay, anyway, I'm not, I'm not bitter either. <laughs> all right, a uh, quick short story. So I... I chose community service over, and, and no, it was, it was 80 some hours. Oh my yeah, 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 because they just pay you minimum wage. And anyway, so the first day, I, I go, to, go to the courthouse where the van picks me up. Didn't connect in my mind that this is like the work release thing. So, <laughs> so I hop in the front seat because I'm the only one there. He's going to the jail after this. And we're just chatting. He goes, so what'd you do? Why, why are you here? And I said, because I ran, or because um, I, I got a speeding ticket. He goes, what? Goes, yeah, I'm too cheap to pay a speeding ticket, so I just opted for this. You know? And so we just drove on. He picked up, like the whole van's full. First thing out of his mouth, ask this guy why he's here. <laughs> and I look at him, so I explain, and, and then he points, he goes, why are you here? And she goes, I tried to kill my boyfriend. <laughs> and it just got better as it went on back to the van. He loved, and by the way, I got free lunch at work release, because he loved to buy me lunch, 
I think because my eyes were probably this big, I was the only one not in an orange jumpsuit. And so I'm sitting there, what in the world? I just went in speeding, I didn't even know it. So, nobody knows it. All right, so you don't have to feel guilty to be guilty. I was guilty. Um, and you don't have to be guilty to feel guilty. I think that's important. Right now, when, when I say that, I want to be very, very clear. You don't have to be guilty of breaking God's law to feel guilty, right? But the feelings of guilt are always working correctly. So, yeah. You, Sorry, I'm just here for fun, but wait. <laughs> so you don't have to... Um, let me make sure I'm following this here. You don't have to be guilty to feel guilty. And you don't, yeah, and you don't have to feel guilty to be guilty. So you don't have to be guilty of breaking God's law to feel guilty. But feelings of guilt are always working correctly. So, <laughs> so like if someone's abused and they feel yeah. guilty because they feel like they deserve it, right? All right. So God's God's law. Let's 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 put that up here. God's law. Right. If I and, and here's the the measurement right here. Right. If if I don't measure up to God's law, what am I? Okay, I'm, I'm a sinner, but in, in the context here, yes. So I, no, that, that's okay. Uh, you're a dog. Yeah, no, 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 yeah, I am, uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm guilty here, right? Anything below this line, and I'm guilty. Now, as I already explained, I might not feel this, even though I am, right? And we, you, you walk by thousands of people every day who that's true of. They don't walk around saying, oh, I'm so guilty of breaking God's law. They just don't. Now, what I did say is you don't have to... I keep, I keep mixing up in my brain. You don't have to be guilty to feel guilty. Right? You can feel guilty even though you haven't broken God's law. But the little kicker that I threw on the end... But guilt is always working correctly. That's where you are. That's yeah. Okay. Okay. How can you feel guilty without breaking God's law? So like abuse. Okay. What, what, what do you mean? So by like, that? I mean, I've worked with, especially girls that have been abused, and uh -huh. they feel like they deserved it. Okay. They did something to deserve the abuse. Okay. And my argument there is their their feelings of guilt are valid. Now, I'm not saying they're correct. Am I, am I just like, babe, you are getting all word weird here. Okay, here, here's what I mean. Okay, so if, if we're not living by God's law, by God's standard, we are living by somebody's standard. Mm -hmm. Is this what you fall in line with, like fear of man issues and stuff like it that? It could be. Yeah. could be fear of man. It, it could be my own law, right? It could be society's standards. But it's some kind of standard. Over here. Oops, standard. And here's this. And if I don't measure up, I'm guilty. Like perfectionism. Could be perfectionism. Right? So, and, and sometimes perfectionism is driven by fear of man. Sometimes perfectionism is dri driven by, by pride. Mm -hmm. Right? And so, I can feel guilty even though I haven't broken God's law, but my feelings of guilt are still valid. Check on, yeah. So that means they're a symptom of a greater issue, or yeah. of a separate issue. Yeah. That if somebody's feeling guilty, even though they haven't broken God's law, okay, what is causing yeah. that guilty, and what standard are you measuring them outside of God's law? Correct. And now, why... Think with me, because I think we're wrestling with something that maybe we haven't all wrestled with before. Why is what I just said important? Because they're valid. Okay.
because they're valid, right? To, to simply tell somebody, well, stop feeling guilty. <laughs> you don't need to feel guilty. Oh, okay, I'll stop. Yeah, and, and maybe I can convince them. But if I can convince them not to feel guilty, what have I effectively done? I have changed the standard. To whose standard? My standard. Not this standard. Now you're starting to grasp what Paul was talking about in Romans chapter 14 when, he, when he's talking about issues of conscience here, right? And, and he's saying, listen, uh, 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 this is Ben's rendition of this. Don't, don't have somebody eat meat whose conscience says don't eat meat, right? Is it breaking God's law if they eat meat? For them. What well, they're not breaking God's law, they're breaking For a standard. Oh, okay. And their conscience is actually functioning just fine. The problem is the, the, the standard by which the conscience is <clears throat> is working. Right? And so what we don't want to do as biblical counselors, and this really is where ACDC is going after, we don't want to get in the business of muting the conscience. Because that thing's working just fine. Like that's that's a God created thing. What we want to do is help calibrate or tweak the standard to God's standard. Is that making sense? Mm -hmm. Is it safe to say that if you're not spending daily time in the word that your standard is going to automatically drift away? Yes, but I also think you can be in God's word. And because, for whatever reason, you can have other standards. Um, I, and I'm, I guess I'm, I'm thinking more of the Pharisees who were in God's law often. Um, but they had designed their own sets of standards over here. Now, I want to be careful. In the counseling office, I'm, I'm going to be very, very careful. And, and probably by careful, gentle with somebody who is dealing with what the world will call false guilt, right? And, and I wouldn't want to say, you're sinning by having false guilt. Because now they might have guilt over their false guilt. <laughs> now, where does that end, right? So I want to be careful with all of this. But I, what, what I want to try and do is help make this the standard by which their conscience is functioning. And for some people, that's going to take a while, and, and, and you need to go slow and be loving as you're doing that. Um, instead of just saying, well, that's an unbiblical standard. Stop it. Um, yeah. So, while you're talking about that, I'm thinking about someone who manifests OCD yeah. tendencies. Yes. And so what you're saying is rather and like is that the the tack you take rather than trying to teach them to think correctly? Or I guess it's all kind of the same. It, thing. Well, it's kind of a both and. I mean, you are trying to help them think clearly, but what you want to do is is go here now with with some OCD stuff. They're struggling with like, am I saved? Um, at least the, the ones that I'm familiar with, am I saved? Right, which is a little bit different than than false guilt. They're they're wrestling with issues of, of salvation. Now, if if they have if they're feeling guilty, and then they go down the line of reasoning, if I feel guilty, I must not be saved, and then they arrive at I'm not saved, and there's like this over and over and over. Um, that's that might be connected to this, um, but I do think I, I even in, in situations like that. I don't want to be the, the standard for them. Otherwise, I end up with emails and phone calls and texts and Facebook messages all the time. Um, help me. Help me. Help me. And what they want is the removal of guilt. Um, and and I, I don't want to do that. Is this helpful? And clarify because th this idea of false guilt is huge and biblical counselors are often accused of oh you don't believe there's false guilt and 
Is there a faulty standard? Absolutely. And can that make the feelings, like the, the guilt light go off? Absolutely. So, but is that false guilt? Or is it just maybe misappropriated guilt or something along those lines? Right, because Freud is the one who brought up the, or who created the idea of false guilt. Is this the question that we should address the concept of guilt can be good? I think it's just leading you to repentance? Or are they just looking for the false guilt? So here, this says re related, or relate your understanding of this, the idea of guilt, and how Christ's death on the cross removes that, that uh, judicial standing of guilt. Okay. Right? Um, so, so relate that then to the idea of false guilt. So we have no condemnation in Christ, right? The Correct. Guilt. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yes? So how would you tackle this with someone that comes in off the court? How would you handle somebody that has false guilt? Yeah, and so it's, it's always going to be very um, individualized because everybody comes in for different reasons. But what I'm, what I'm looking for is what, who or what's their standard, right? So if, uh, if from a very young age they had other people's standards as their guilt meter, like, oh, if I can just live up to mom and dad's standards, I'm not guilty, right? Um, then I gotta, you better hope mom and dad were Christians. Um, and even if they were Christians, there still could be some, you know, options for it. <laughs> but that's, what, that's where I'm gonna wanna start um, if they're really struggling with guilt. Um, and and if, if I've gone over the gospel, if we've gone over, we're gonna talk about justification in just a minute, but if, if I've gone over that, if we've gone over everything related to the gospel and they're still feeling guilty, I'm going to go with it. I'm not going to say, you know what, you just need to not feel guilty. Or uh, when you are feeling guilty, you know, and try and come up with, with something other than figuring out what's their standard. And oftentimes, I don't know, Carrie, you, you can speak to this. I know, sorry. Um, oftentimes, it's their own standard that that it's just either through the roof, like perfection, um, and they're not resting in the work of Jesus. There, it's it, it's really a, a works based salvation. Although they wouldn't say that, but it's a God's happy with me today because I fill in the blank. Or God's God hates me today because I and then that's where the guilt comes oh, sure. in. Sure, and so but, you can say how do you know? Yeah. What's what's the standard of right and wrong or guilty or not guilty? Yeah. And you have to explain that. That's kind of helps you understand where where that's coming from. Yeah. Yeah. Is this sort of what Paul was talking about in First Corinthians four, where he talks about the very small thing I should not be judged by anyone? I don't even judge myself. Um, I, 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 he says, but with me, it's a very small thing that I should be judged by you or any human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself, for I'm not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. Is that sort of falling in line? Is that what he's talking about there? As far as the standard? Yeah, he's basically saying that, that it's not his standard that he, he goes by, right? That he doesn't judge himself by himself, that he's basically not very not self-conscious um, of, of himself. Does that fall in line with what we're talking about? Maybe. Um, I, I, I mean, yeah, what, I what you're talking mind, about... So I was just curious. If yeah, what, what, what you're talking about is absolutely in line with what we're talking about. I'm, I just, I would want to read a little bit more of Paul's... I, I can't recall all of it right now to say absolutely that's what Paul's talking about there. Um, but what you just said fits exactly with what we're talking about. Yeah, I, I don't want my standard to be society. Because um, if you're younger, it might not, you, you might not uh, be able to recognize the large swing than if you're older. You go, wow, society is way different than it used to be. And society is my, my bar, right? Um, wow. Uh, 
probably going to be too low, <laughs> way too low, right? Um, so yeah, I, I, I just think there's all of that. Yeah, and then the notes too. I read uh, the last paragraph on page 51. That helped me kind of understand it. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, I found this quote, Amy Baker. Um, she has a book called Picture Perfect, When Life Doesn't Line Up. And I, I, I just want to let you know, if I could have Amy Baker come out here and teach a ton, I would. She very much holds to I don't teach men, so she won't come out for that. Um, but she, her book is just outstanding, and her, her line of thinking is, is excellent. Anyways, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and read it since it was very helpful for you. Um, Many would label the experience of bad feelings in such situations as false guilt. The term false guilt is helpful in indicating that a rule not mandated by God's word has been established and broken. There's that standard. Right? So, let me, let me say that again. Um, a rule not mandated, you might want to underline that or circle, not mandated by God's word has been established and broken. However, the term is not useful if it causes one to conclude nothing's wrong. There's no problem to be addressed and solved. Right? So if somebody's like, ah, I just need to learn to ignore that. Wrong. Right? You don't want to learn to do that. In fact, there is a problem to be addressed when false guilt occurs. The problem is that of using something as a standard other than God's word. When false guilt occurs, somewhere along the line, the person has begun using someone else's word as her standard. Perhaps it's the word of her mother who insisted that the house be vacuumed daily. Perhaps it's the word of a boss who insisted it's not okay to ever make a presentation error. Perhaps it's the word of a dad who insisted it was a sin to be late. Or perhaps it's the word of her own heart's cravings that, she's always, that she always be the best. Do, do you see how that, that helps, right? Um, and I, I know um, this, this kind of gets into, the, a, a few weeks ago I mentioned a book on the conscience. Very, very helpful um, in, in understanding this. So any other questions? Or Would you put strongholds in, in that category? What do you mean by strongholds? Well, that, like just a belief system that, that maybe the enemy, again, through your parents, that, that's maybe been passed down, but the enemy is put there. And then the Bible has, you know, some specific verses for um, battling against strongholds. Okay. Um, would you use that? Or? Um, so, I, I, I think it cause you to act a certain way based on that belief. So here's where I'll, I'll come at it with the word stronghold. So um, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5, the word stronghold is used. Um, and so Paul, well, let's, let's go there. In my Bible, I was almost there anyway. Um, so 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and, and, and I'll answer your question. Um, verses 3 through 5. So, it, it, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not wage war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare um, are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of... Now, some translations say strongholds, and some say... This one says fortresses, but same, same idea here. Um, and then he goes on to say, we are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. So here... Paul is talking, he, he's equating strongholds and arguments raised up against the knowledge of God, right? And so um, to that end, I, I would say that's, that, that fits right in here, right? There can be arguments, lofty opinions, lines of reasoning that are not God's law. There's something else over here, right? And so we do need to help people battle that. Um, now, if... My, my own experience with the word stronghold is more of like a ancestral thing that's passed on because of what somebody did back here. Um, that's, that's my experience with that word stronghold. Um, so I, I don't think that fits this, this particular question. Yeah. All right. I have just a quick question, not yes. to the question, but to your um, resources down here. Mm -hmm. 
when we're doing our papers and we want to reference a particular author or uh, whatever it is, and we're referencing it more than once, do we need to put it more than once like you did here? So there's there's something called Ibid. If if it's if it's the next like so like if you, if you reference it here and it's your next reference you can just put this down and then the page number okay. if you want that's a whole lot faster um, than if there's others in between like we might put it further if, the so if you if you did Marshall blah 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 right um, and, and let's say uh, that Marshall wrote a good book. <laughs> well, you're done, my friend. <laughs> um, then, and like here, the, the very first time you would reference all the information. The second one down, you can just reference the title of the book and the page number. So, good book, and then the page number, and that that should be sufficient. Should be. Okay. Good. Good question. That way, you're not over and over and over. Although, I you can just highlight. Right click, copy, paste. Yeah, well, I was just thinking because it takes up a lot of room on that paper. It does, yes, correct. Yeah, yep, I agree. I agree. All right, let's take a break because that one was good. I love talking about full skill.